we've started recording yes sir so dr shintal parikh has already joined uh, sandeep was trying to join but uh, probably he has uh, some issue with bandwidth so we'll wait for him to join but uh, let's uh, start getting going you know meanwhile so what i'll do is uh, today's uh, session is going to be on uh, lateral condyle fractures what we plan to cover today are the the fresh injuries you know acute fractures we also plan to cover some of the difficulties and complications maybe the delayed presentations and non unions we'll keep it for some other session because it will be too much to you know sort of digest in in one setting you know so you know we'll we'll keep going as it goes and we have around 1 and 1/2 hours so we start at 6:30 and we want to end by around 8 o'clock because we have a posse webinar today at 8 um for the journal club so you know we want to end before that if possible mm, okay so shital uh, uh, can you hear us yeah yeah i can hear you okay okay so we'll start with some of the cases and uh, i want to start first with the most uh, you know sort of uh, uh, important issues which uh, the which um, our fellows have sort of expressed desire to learn about which are the dilemma of undisplaced lateral condyle fractures so when you have a fracture like this uh, uh, you know you tend to sulk and this is seemingly undisplaced lateral condyle fractures you know that's a uh, unofficial acronym for for these undisplaced lateral condyle fracture and uh, let's uh, you know start with some of the cases which i have put today in the in the fellowship group so this was one of the cases i had put eight year old child uh, with uh, lateral condyle fracture and always as always you your investigations are not complete till the time you have the internal rotation view which is which is here and this is the fracture which starts and stop short uh, the fracture gap is less than a millimeter and uh, uh, there were a lot of views uh, you know from the delegates people suggested that uh, some people suggested you can observe plaster but majority people felt that uh, close reduction and pinning should be done in this fracture so shital what is your your view on this you know this fracture which is a fresh injury in a 8 year, year old child or how would you treat this um you know we uh, can you hear me okay yes yes absolutely so uh, uh yeah we have a really good system of um of follow up and clinics every day for fracture patients so uh if the family is reliable and if the gap is you know like what you have described this case then we feel comfortable um treating them conservative and explaining that they need weekly follow up to get x rays because these fractures can move um and these are the common types which are missed to where the fracture line is you know medial to the uh, to the capitular physis and these um have a little bit uh, less rates of having other issues like growth arrest and stuff where we need anatomic fixation so uh these minimally displaced fractures i would you know put them in a cast and have them come back in a week take the cast off and get new x rays so at one week you will take the plaster off take x ray and, and if everything is okay you put back in plaster yeah it's it's difficult to uh, to see the fracture line and displacement with the cast on yes so um uh so we would prefer to just take the cast off and get a new x ray absolutely so it's a very important lesson we have learned today there are two lessons in fact one is that in such fracture which are minimally displaced you know stop, stopping short of physis you can opt for conservative treatment it's important to take x rays at one week that's the second lesson we have learned and third lesson we have learned is that when you take an x ray you know don't take x ray through the plaster it's important take off the plaster take the x ray and then reapply the plaster um so this was one of the patients and i i hope now uh, sort of there is a clarity um among uh people here so this is the second fracture uh, which uh, you know it's uh, on internal rotation view again the displacement is not much going into the physis uh but uh, you know it's not 
two millimeter, maybe less than that. So she will, you know, you know, more people were more clear uh, among the, the delegates that they want to go under, go for close reduction and pin fixation. So how, how would you manage this? Are you, can this be managed conservatively? Is there any chance or you would always fix this? Yeah, no, I would, I would manage this conservative. To me, it doesn't look like it's more than two millimeter displaced. So the, the issue is that with undisplaced or minimally displaced fractures, you, you can treat it conservative. If they are you know, significantly displaced, rotated, then you treat it operative. The main issue is the one that are in between, which is two to four millimeters. So to me, this is due. So I, I would manage this conservative, but you know, if it's a little bit hinged open or gapped open a little bit more, that is when you make the decision whether you want to um, you know, operate or not. So uh, with, the, uh, with the view that you have now, you're, you're probably, I don't know how much you're measuring, but it's, it's gonna be around two millimeters or three around that area. So, so this is the third patient, you know, so and, 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 and in this patient, again, people agreed that, you know, everyone said that they would not take a chance and put pins close. Yeah, reduction. so here, so this is the, the case before this, I would treat it conservative for sure. The one that was so before is, that, because you can see that this is less than two. But when you go to the next case, this is where the borderline issue is, is between two and four. It's not significantly displaced, but it's not undisplaced either. So you have something in between. And so my recommendation is, you know, you speak with the family, you see how, you know, how your resources are, and you see how, what you're comfortable with. Because if you have to pin this or put a screw in, this is one of the easiest surgery for you for lateral conduct because you know it's already there. You just it just needs the push, and um, if you are not uh, you know seeing too many lateral condyle fractures, probably you know uh, to be on the safe side. If you are towards fixation, it's not a bad thing you know because uh, if you can't follow up the patient on a weekly basis or if the patient shows up late for a second follow up and the fracture is displaced, then then probably you'll have to open it. So um, I think this is a case where I would feel comfortable fixing it, but if someone wants to treat it non-op and wait for another week, it's not the wrong thing to do. Personally, I would, you know, I feel that it's displaced enough that, you know, it's better to put uh, uh, pins or screws across. Right. So, you know, from the delegates, you know, is this issue sort of now clear, you know, with these three cases, where you know you have two cases where we said we are going to conserve definitely, and this one, which where you you sh you would opt for an operative treatment because you know it it assures you a uh, you know union. Whereas leaving it alone, there are more chances that this would go for non-union or displace. So any any issues, you can unmute yourself or you know type in the chat box and let us know. In the displacement, when we see the papers, they're talking about displacement. That's a maximum displacement. It's not metaphysical. It's not at the physis. It's not wherever you can measure the maximum displacement. That is where the displacement, that's what is taken into account. So sometimes you would see that the right. fracture is more displaced on the metaphysical side. And sometimes you would see that it might be a little bit more, uh, you know, hinged open or, you know, in a reverse way. That means you may have a little bit more gap on the on the uh, physal side or the where the physis is. So irrespective, you, you take the measurement where the measurement is the greatest measurement, preferably on the internal rotation view. So here, you know, laterally, of course, fracture gap is more, but even medially, there is significant fracture gap. And these are the fractures which are more uh, sort of likely to displace. So, okay. So with this introduction, uh, if there are no further questions on this, I'm gonna go further. Uh, into this issue and uh, just going to go through a few of the papers. I'm going to share these papers later on with you. And these are words of wisdom. And uh, what is known as sort of seemingly undisplaced fractures, you know, as people say, they account for majority of lateral condyle fractures, almost 50% of them. So if you are you know dealing with 10 lateral condyle fractures in here, five of them would be sort of minimally displaced or undisplaced, you know, and you need to treat them there. And what is also known as 4 to 40 percent are going to displace in plaster in different series, which means by fixing each undisplaced lateral condyle fracture as fracture of necessity, we are over treating 60 to 95 percent of fractures. 
Okay, so so it's important to know which you know conservatively treat and should you should treat and which definitely need fixation. And of course, there is an issue of situational uh, orthopedics, as Sandeep coins that term, and and she will very clearly mention that if the family is not available for follow up at one week, you know. That will also make a difference in decision making whether you want to fix these fractures or you want to treat the plaster. So what is known is displacement if it occurs in occurs in mostly in first five weeks, and that's why the importance of one week X-ray. If the fracture has not displaced on week one X-ray, it's unlikely that it's going to displace any further. Okay, so that's why X-ray at one week out of out of plaster is very important. What is also important to know that fractures. Which go into the articular surface, which fracture the articular surface also, will are more likely to displace because you know we have an attachment of common extensor you know, there. But fractures which stop stop short of physis or don't enter into the articular surface are unlikely to fracture. The problem is unless you do an ultrasound or MRI or an arthrogram, it's very difficult to differentiate between the two. On a plain X-ray, many times, which are gone beyond the physis, but are they short of articular surface or they are going into the articular surface? But there are some kind of you know radiological parameter which are available from literature that if fracture gap is less than one millimeter, the risk of displacement is zero percent. Now in Jacobs classification. Jacob one is all fractures less than two millimeter, you know, blanket. But out of this, the fractures which are less than one millimeter fracture gap, wherever medial lateral in whichever view, maximum fracture gap, if it's less than one millimeter, they are unlikely to displace further, and you can safely treat conservatively. If fracture gap is more than two millimeter, almost fifty percent of them would displace. You know, that is what she mentioned, two to four millimeter. So, so in whichever view, whichever fracture gap, if it's more than two millimeter, they are more likely to displace, and hence you should pin them after reducing. Now, central fracture gap is more important. So, if central fracture gap, if it's more, if if it's equal to the lateral gap, they are more likely to displace. If central fracture gap is narrow and lateral fracture gap is more, you know, it means it's a convergent fracture. And Some of those fractures may not displace, and fractures which will short, short, which will not displace. Fractures with broken articular hinge will displace. So these are some of the things which are known from the literature, from papers, and we know from Song's work that X-ray in internal rotation shows fracture displacement better. So you will not comment or decide the management until you have AP lateral and oblique all three views. Okay. So based on this, you know, I have my own algorithm for managing. Seemingly undisplaced lateral condyle fractures, which we call it as sutra, and I'll I'll go through how I manage these fractures step by step. Okay, so you have apparently undisplaced acute lateral condyle fractures. What you do first thing is take X-ray in internal rotation, and and how do you know the X-ray is taken in internal rotation? If radius and ulna overlap by one third, then it's an X-ray which is properly taken in internal rotation. Okay, so this is the X-ray you take. Now the fractures well. The fracture gap maximum is less than one millimeter. The fracture is convergent, meaning lateral. It the fracture gap is more than the medial fracture gap, and each one less than one millimeter. And the fracture which are short of five six, these will most likely that they will heal in plaster. They are stable varieties of fracture, and you can treat them in plaster. Fractures which are displaced one to two millimeter, and their fracture line is parallel. Okay, so these are indeterminate. You really don't know which way to go, and here the decision may depend on getting an MRI done or examining these patients under anesthesia and taking stress view or situational orthopedics. You know, you give a plaster, see the patient again in one week time, take an X-ray and see if it displaces further. If it does displaces, then you pin. If it doesn't displace, you continue with plaster. If If family is come from say 400 kilometers away and and patient will not be able to come back for one week X-ray or unreliable family, then it is better to pin them straight away. You know that is what I how I would go about those patients. Fractures which are displaced more than two millimeter, where medial gap is equal or more than lateral gap, and especially fractures which are translated in lateral view. Okay, so this is one more clue. If the fracture is translated in a lateral view, it's an unstable fracture. 
so it may look good on AP and internal oblique. And those are the these are the fractures which are unstable in the spin. Okay, so stable ones slab at one week. If it remains undisplaced in continuum plaster, some of these patients which are seemingly stable may show some displacement at one week or may fail to unite at three to four weeks, and they are the ones who will require fixation. Okay, so stable the fracture being stable is not hundred percent guarantee that fracture will heal and will not displace. Indeterminate fractures, you know, sometimes we prefer to do an MRI under sedation. So do an MRI if on MRI the articular hinge continues, you know, if the articular hinge is broken, then those patients then we admit and spray we take to the OT and do pin. If the articular hinge is intact, you know, we will give a plaster and send the patient home. These patients, if they are you know, it's, if it's not possible to follow, then you know one one would go for pinning straight away. If the family is reliable, doesn't want to get MRI done, MRI facilities are not available, we can still go for plaster, take an X-ray at one week, and if it displaces, go for pinning at one week, and and you will do no harm. The fractures which are unstable, uh, close reduction in pinning is the answer. So some of the cases, you know, just to illustrate this, this is five-year-old elbow trauma. Tenderness along the lateral aspect, AP and lateral X rays, everything looks normal, you know, but on internal rotation view, you see this small fracture which is short of crisis. You classify that as stable, well fitting above elbow slab. I give a slab for those patients because, uh, you know, you have to remove it at one week time, but a well fitting. If you are not confident about your slab, then give a plaster. I give it in forearm in supination and wrist in dorsiflexion. Risk in dorsiflexion because that would neutralize the common extensor origin. So these are a few of the important uh, points. You X-ray out of the plaster or slab at one week. You confirm that there is no displacement fracture. It's okay. Um, plaster out at three weeks. You know, and then you see here that fracture is not displaced, but still union is not perfect. So continue immobilization. Follow this patient till the fracture completely heals. And now you see this is the X-ray at five weeks. It shows complete union. So this is the time when I would say that no more immobilization and mobilize the patient, and we don't need any further follow up. So follow up till union is which is very very important. This is a five-year-old child with uh, elbow injury. We saw this patient, and this patient, you know, this is classified as indeterminate. So we asked the parents to get MRI done. Parents did not want an MRI. So we gave a trial of plaster, and as Sheetal said, we took out the plaster at one week, did an X-ray. There is no displacement on AP lateral and oblique view. In fact, there is an early callus seen at one week. So we said, okay, continue with conservative treatment. At four weeks, this is the X-ray which shows good union. Okay, so at four weeks only after good union, you see new discharge. This is a four-year-old child with elbow injury, AP and lateral. Again, on AP and lateral, you will say that fracture gap is less than one millimeter, fracture gap looks a little more, and this is the importance of internal rotation. So again here, because the fracture gap is not more than two millimeters, this was classified as indeterminate. We asked for MRI for this patient. And now you can see when we did an MRI, this MRI shows fracture line, which goes all across to the articular surface, okay? And when it goes all across to the articular surface, this patient, if you put in plaster, uh, you know, there are high chance of displacement uh, because it's an unstable fracture. You know, the common extensor origin would displace this fracture, even in a well fitting plaster is given. So, what you do is in this patient, uh, uh, these are some of the other views on MRI. Again, somebody was asking about what is the anatomy, and that's why I put this view. You can see that this is the direction of the fracture on a transverse view. Okay. So this is not a, on a transverse view, it is not a fracture like this. Medial part and lateral part separate. No, it's an oblique fracture. And because of if, if it's, it's an oblique fracture, your fixation should go from posterior to anterior in lateral combat fractures. In supracondylar fractures, we say that try to put pins from anterior to posterior because the condyle is tilted 45 degrees forward. But in lateral condyle fractures, your pin should go from posterior to anterior. Again, this is the reason why internal rotation view shows you fracture better. Because this fracture line is oblique. 
moment you internally rotate, you see the fracture line in profile, and that's the reason internal rotation view uh, shows you the fracture line better. Okay, so these are the MRI views uh, based on which the uh, was broken, and this patient uh, required close reduction, uh, uh, pinning, and so you know, to confirm the reduction of the article. Then again, uh, you follow these patients with the time it completely heals and then discharge. This is the patient uh, which we took Chito's opinion on, third patient. Internal rotation view here shows that and that to that, almost equal. So 100% here the articular cartilage is broken. There is no need of doing any investigation, no MRI is required here. You straightway take these patients for close reduction and for cutaneous screen. Sheetal, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, one of the webinars when we were discussing lateral condyle fractures, you said there is there is nothing in situ pinning or lateral They will always require some sort of reduction. And there are your voices breaking. I can't, I don't know if others have the same issue. I can't, I can't hear your question. I, I couldn't hear it either. Taral, please repeat the question. Okay, I will repeat the question. In one of the webinars on lateral condyle fractures, she once said that there is nothing like pinning in C2 for lateral condyle fractures. Uh, you know, most of these fractures which seem to be undisplaced, you said that require close reduction and then pinning. So, you know, I just wanted you to qualify that statement or tell us more in detail about that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, in C2 means, I mean, you know, you're not going to uh, pin an undisplaced fracture anyway. So whenever you have a little bit of uh, uh, displacement, you know, whether it's uh, hinged or whether it's uh, translated, you need to push it a little bit towards the main fragment. So, you know, in C2 means uh, if you're saying you, you pin the uh, fracture the way it is, then probably you don't have compression across the fracture site. And if you don't have compression, it's going to take longer for the fracture to heal. It might still go on to heal. So it's better to just push it. And it just requires a push, uh, you know, with your thumb, uh, you know, from the lateral condyle. And, and then you pin or put a screw across so that you can have uh, better position. Right, absolutely. And one of the other ways of doing this is to, you know, you can see varus and valgus view. So always put a valgus stress to close the fracture gap and in addition, you know, use your thumb to give pressure. So, you know, you have to improve the position, give the pressure and then pass a wire initially and then decide your fixation, whether pins or screws, you know, depending on the age of the patient. So we are going to come to that discussion also later as to what implant do we use. So in this patient, in internal rotation position, again, you're passing a wire uh, initially, posterior to anterior. The initial wire is a fixing wire, then you actually pass uh, you know, wires which are definitive wires. This was a younger child. So we decided to put multiple pins here. So two divergent pins here. In this child, we did not prefer to do an arthrogram because, uh, you know, this, this uh, reduction uh, uh, you know, looked fine on the x-rays in that patient. And this is post-op x-ray. Uh, and then follow-up of this patient till union and KY removal after the fracture heals, you know, these are some of the important things. In younger child, we prefer to pass k wires. but older child, we will uh, put screws. So, uh, any questions on this uh, till now, you know? Undisplaced lateral condyle fractures, we have options of management. Uh, any questions from delegates? Any further sort of uh, um, comments from uh, Sandeep or Sheetal on these? Something I missed, or something which needs more clarity. I, hello, I think you need a very high index of suspicion when you have a swollen elbow in a child and you think there is no fracture. Everybody who's working in a public institute or even private, our tendency is to say X ray of the elbow, AP, and lateral. The first thing you should do is every elbow x-ray has to be AP lateral and internal. Oblique. Unless you do that and get into the habit of taking internal oblique, you will always miss 
a type one supra uh, lateral condyle fracture, which is very important. Second problem is second problem is sorry, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your audio. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> yeah. So one is always remember AP lateral internal oblique. Second, if the patient has come from a, some other place with a slab, please remove the slab. Never take an X-ray with a slab on of whatever kind. To diagnose again a type one lateral condyle fracture, your elbow has to be without any external splintage. Otherwise, you will miss the fracture. And third, in the mind eye of your mind, you have to imagine the lateral condyle as being posterior lateral. As Karal said, it's an oblique plane fracture. So everything happens in that plane. Your fixation, your X-ray beam, and your reduction pushing it into place. So always remember AP lateral internal oblique and remove the plaster and take X-ray. Thank you, sir. So Sandeep, two of your cases, you know, I want you to discuss these uh, two similar looking X-ray of you know, undisplaced lateral condyle fractures. And uh, you can take a little discussion on these two cases. So I put them and share it on the screen. So this. Yeah, so this is typically what happens. The first, you can see that the child had a history of injury with a swollen elbow and the surgeon had taken the x-rays correctly and identified the fracture. And he was put in a plaster cast because the medial, it was like Taran said, convergent. The lateral side seemed to be wider and the medial side seemed to be uh, less than one millimeter. So that's X-ray in plaster. Taran, next slide if you can show. Now, this is another one with the same X-ray picture. Similar kind of X-ray picture, but look at the gap here. The gap in the fracture is extending far more medially than the earlier X-ray. This child was also put in a plaster, but in a week's time, you can see as the cast became loose, you can see the gap between the plaster and the uh, skin of the child in the second X-ray below the primary. You see that the gap has actually increased in size. So typically what happens is that the swelling reduces the child starts moving his finger flexors and extensors and because of the pull of the extensor, the fragments start separating out and becoming detached from the primary. And from the articular crack, the synovial fluid starts leaking into that gap. And that child ultimately went on to a non-union. So Sheetal, you have seen such situations. Any, any additional comments? Yeah, so... Um... This uh, this fracture on the first left, you know, I would have treated it conservative with a you know strict follow up every week. Uh, I wouldn't have pinned it right from in the beginning, uh, but you know when you look at the second set of uh, when you look at these X rays here, that that those are concerning. So at this point, I would make a decision to fix it. So I would not let it go on to have you know, a delayed union or a non-union. So when I see this this much of um, uh, fracture gap, uh, then especially here, you can see that, now sometimes it's difficult because you don't know if this is the callus that forms the bump or is this a displacement, but it seems like there is displacement and I would take an X-ray out of the cast, you know, not in the cast for the same reason. See here, it's all blurry here. You don't know what is callus. You don't know what is a fracture line on the AP view because the cast material is, uh, is not allowing you to interpret it very well. So I would repeat the x-ray and take the cast off uh, uh, and then determine. But if it's, if it's displacing, the, the other thing when we're looking at um, x-rays, uh, serial x-rays every week, you're looking at the progression of uh, you know, healing or displacement. So even if you're not calculating the, 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 the distance or the maximum displacement, if you see that the fracture is drifting, then it would continue to drift. Then I would be a little bit, um, you know, more aggressive about taking the patient to the OR and uh, and fixing it, uh, because there is discrepancy when you talk about displacement, where to measure, and which classification system to use. You know, Thurl mentioned his classification system that you know at one millimeters he's stable, and at two he's going to pin it. 
whereas the WISE classification system, which is the one that is based on uh, displacement and treatment, that classifies the displacement as, um, as two and four. That means less than two is cast, more than four is surgery, and between two and four, you can do close reduction, you can do arts program, you can determine the hinge, and then you can treat accordingly. So it's, it's, so for me, it is two and four. But for Thurl, it is one and two. So it depends on you know what classification system you use. They are not all you know like set in stone that this is how you determine it. But the idea is that if you see like if you're doing serial X-rays, even if you don't calculate whether it's two or four, if you're seeing serial displacement that the, that the fracture is drifting away on two X-rays, then it is going to continue to drift. Then I would be more aggressive and treat and fix it rather than keeping on you know checking it every week. Um, so my take on the uh, the one case that you showed at the second X-ray, I would have taken the X-ray out of the cast and I would have pinned it or put a screw in, but I would have fixed it at that point. I wouldn't have allowed it to go on yeah. for a delay yeah. or non-union. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just trying to highlight with these two X-rays that the similar looking X-ray can behave absolutely diametrically opposite. And at no point in time should the fellows start thinking that a lateral condyle behaves like a supracondyler. Give a cast, pack off the patient and send him off cannot be the treatment in a lateral condyle, even type 1. The one-week follow-up and mandatory X-ray in internal rotation oblique outside cast is very important, especially when you are conserving. See, the type 3 fracture, everybody can diagnose that it is outside and rotated. That hardly ever goes into non-union because everybody identifies and fixes it. Non-unions happen because of missing type 1, which is unstable and allowing it to drift. So please remember the one-week x-ray out of cast. So can I say that, can I, I'm going to make a statement and I want uh, you know people to either you know get offended or defend it. So I'm making a statement here is that when in an seemingly undisplaced lateral condyle fracture, one week X-ray, if it's not going to be available, or, or you, you don't, you know, uh, sort of uh, suppose that family is going to come back for follow-up at one week, you know, whenever in doubt, you should pin on day one, you know, am I right in saying that or am I, am I wrong? So both Sheetal, Sandeep and any of the delegates can, you know, uh, speak for or against this statement. Yeah, Sheetal, you know, we'll start uh, yeah, if it's really undisplaced, like you can barely see the fracture line, you can't even calculate the displacement, I would treat it in a cast. But mm -hmm. so, but if it's like, say, one or two millimeters uh, displaced, and I'm watching to see if there is any further opening or if there is displacement at one week, but the patient is not going to follow up or it's unreliable, then it does make a case, especially it makes a case for those who are in rural setting or those who are not used to seeing these fractures very often. I think it may be, uh, uh, it may be more, it may be better for them to pin it because one, it's easy surgery when it's undisplaced or minimally displaced. It's easy surgery, and second is that then you don't have to follow up. You can just see them at four or four or six weeks and remove the K wires. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, so even that, uh, so that is at uh, at uh, at uh, for two millimeters or less because more than two. I would definitely, you know, evaluate each patient and be more aggressive. But when it's less than two, even then you can have a wide spectrum. Like the case that Sandeep showed that you had gap both on the medial and the lateral side, that wasn't a hinged fracture. It was like the hinge was broken versus someone who has a very minimal or hardly you can see the fracture line. I would be okay treating it with a cast. Yeah. But it's so better to err. It's better to err on the side of being a little bit more aggressive if there is some displacement and the, and the patient is not going to follow up. So one of the questions yeah. from audience is that, Sandeep, before you speak, you know, yeah. also answer that when you make a comment, is that suppose patient comes at two weeks and then you feel it's now displacing, is it still fixable at that point? So answer that question and also the statement which we made. Yeah, sure. So first thing is that you have, if it presents late at two weeks and it is displaced, it definitely needs close reduction and fixation. And if the metaphyseal fragment is big enough, you use a compression screw because that will give you a better compression and lateral column fixation will take care of the problem. You could do an arthrogram to see how the joint line looks. And as far as your first comment, I will definitely agree with what Sheetal said. 
the the problem is shital that everybody does not have a discerning eye to differentiate 1 mm and 2 mm displacements so if they are not really confident that a patient is going to turn up for follow up my take is that advise them pinning put the ball in their court if they refuse pinning and they get a cast and go away one medically legally you are safe you have advised a fixation if they don't turn up and end up with non union and if they agree to it i would pin them if they are going to be unreliable to follow so you know, from my I, side i, I say taral you advise them yeah i do agree that you know uh, it it is difficult 1 and 2 mm but what i was saying is that if you can if the fracture is truly undisplaced it's just a small crack that you can barely see there is less swelling patient is young those patients you know i just think that you know pin track infection and you know intra complications or patient not falling after putting the pins and ending up with the septic elbow so pin pinning is not considered to be benign as well you know especially if you have a family that you don't know is reliable and you're not going to be able to follow up putting pins in and then the patient doesn't show up or shows up late and has infection that's an issue so i would be a little bit you know i wouldn't say that all fractures you should pin if the patient is not coming back I, you know that's what we are coming at is Should, should all lateral condyle be pinned and i wouldn't say that you know i would say that if it's truly undisplaced forget about the millimeters but if it's truly undisplaced if you just see a line but there is no opening no displacement you know i think that patient can go in a cast you know we have all seen those you know barely visible fractures you know uh, the patient has a little bit of uh, tenderness when you press in that area maybe mild swelling but nothing like a, a swollen elbow or it's a very low grade injury think those patients because if we put a blanket statement that you know if the patient is unreliable pin them all you would you know have a lot of unnecessary you know surgeries and besides that you know if some patients would end up with issues and if you're talking about medical legal uh, concerns then that is uh, i think um, uh, an issue against you if you have pinned an undisplaced fracture and then you end up with a complication so it's it's on oh, both sides i would i would i would you know i would be a little bit cautious taking that approach that if the patient is not following up just pin all of them yeah premal so it, yeah sandeep the, yeah no question is how you counsel them i think undisplaced fractures warn them about displacement and suggest surgery if they don't it's the ball is in their court take their consent for that and i agree that a non union probably is a simpler thing to treat later on rather than an infected septic elbow so you know this is what you know some of the clarity is coming to among undisplaced lateral condyle <clears throat> fracture most of the studies have shown that almost 60 to 70% in some says 90% patients are those which are stable undisplaced lateral condyle fracture which can be easily treated in cast you know the question is of rest 10 to 40% which are which are going to displace in cast and i think it's it's important to identify those patients uh, you know and if you cannot identify and you put in plaster you know take x ray again at one week out of plaster and if you feel that the fracture is drifting away pin it at that time but yeah. most of the children uh, can still be treated in plaster if they are stable and you, you watch very well okay so with this we come to the second part uh, of lateral condyle if there are any still question from this you know uh, uh, people can still put in chat box or ask unmute and uh, uh, ask us the question as far as pinning is concerned we have two techniques here uh, if premal was here online is he still here around premal i don't see him. you don't see him. okay so you know premal has a technique uh, of close reduction and pinning with k wires and i'll just try to put his slides together and see so i'm sharing his presentation uh, premal at any time if you join please let us know and you can talk about it so this is premal's patient and uh, this is a technique of arthrogram and reduction so this was his patient seven year old child with a fresh injury lateral condyle fracture and uh, on internal rotation view uh, you know see here that uh, there is market displacement 
so uh, shitul this will be a case definitely for a pinning right you can't this one in plastic right so going to premal koti uh, you know painted and draped and then what this is traction view the water speed where you see the displacement and on valgus and as shipper suggested you put a thumb um, and speed get reduced uh, and lot of people have this question that you know how i'm sure that my reduction is uh, sort of a good reduction there is a lot of question on the uh, whatsapp group that you know many times when we reduce everything looks okay but uh, when we see the x ray in plaster or follow up you know the fracture is not in position so what, what could be reasons for that you know one of the reasons i feel the you know the your reduction may be good but pinning may not be proper you know the pin may not have actually gone through the fracture site and stabilized it or what you see the the, the cm quality may not be good so you know over to sheetal and sandeep both of you you know what are the causes where uh, the reduction of fixation goes wrong in a close reduction in pinning what are the mistakes people make common Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So you know, one thing is that arthrogram for close reduction arthrogram is very very useful. You can use it for both purposes. You can do an arthrogram before you start, uh, you know, reduction and pinning, and that is to determine if the hinge is intact. Because if the hinge is intact, then you know that, you know, it's easier to push on it, put your pins in, and don't worry about you know, uh, of uh, you know, not having a good reduction. but if it's completely displaced fracture like what we saw on this x-ray then what you're doing the arthrogram for is to confirm that your reduction is adequate you know so in that case it's better not to do it pre op but you fix it first in the position that you think uh, is anatomic and then you do an arthrogram to confirm the articular surface so you can do it pre uh, the arthrogram can be done before or it could be done after based on the situation so for completely displaced fractures if you're going to treat it closed like attempt a reduction you get a good reduction you pin it then i would do an arthrogram to confirm it and for those which are 2 mm displaced i would do it beforehand to see how the hinge is because if the hinge is intact you don't even need to do too much you know as you put the pin in or you put a screw in it will going to compress which is you know it's much easier to uh, pin a fracture which is hinged open rather than you know completely displaced so um so those are the those are for the arthrogram for as far as you know having a follow up and then seeing the fracture is not in the best position it could be because of either inadequate reduction or loss of reduction that means you had it well reduced you pinned it but the pinning was not in the optimal configuration or you put a screw and it was too close to the metaphysis spike instead of being you know in the middle of the fracture then it is going to displace you know later on or if you didn't get a good reduction and you didn't appreciate it on your on your c arm so in that case always an arthrogram is the best uh, way to check it you know um i'm not a big you know we're not talking about intra op but even before i'm not a big fan of mri because it involves sedation all these kids are younger it's expensive sedation and i don't gain too much of information unless it's a delayed case or if you know a non union something or even a mal union then mri would help me to plan things so i you know but for acute fractures i don't usually get mri so because and then things can move so if you get an mri at one week and everything is good doesn't mean that it's going to be the same way at two weeks so then are you going to repeat another mri at two weeks so for that reason for fresh fractures i don't usually use mri i would just based on how the x ray looks and the intra op arthrogram but uh, but those are the reasons if you're talking about why does it look bad when it comes back it could be uh, you know either uh, inadequate reduction or loss of reduction Yeah, Sandeep. Uh, yeah. I, so, other than what Sheetal pointed out, what I can just say is that if it's a completely displaced fracture, again the uh, the posterior lateral fragment has to be pushed into place with a little valgus in the elbow, like you said, so that we get good contact. And if we have done an arthrogram earlier, you'll always see a die gap, and when you reduce it, that gets lost, or you see a thin line. that gap reduces dramatically otherwise there's a die leak from the fracture from the articular margin to the fracture 
and when you reduce the fragment it gets squ uh, squished out and you just see a thin line there the second reason i have always seen is that sometimes if the child is young and you are enthusiastic with your screw too much over compression can actually crush that cartilage if the placement is not right so on the lateral side you have crushed and caused a tilt which may open up in the intraarticular part so this this is a positioning screw with some amount of compression you don't keep on turning the screw head till the head actually sinks into the cartilage you must be very careful when you put the screw in younger kids and i prefer that younger kids we put divergent k wires and if required i put a additional transverse wire to engage the trochlea in fact the metaphysis on the medial side rather than the trochlea which can be taken off uh, early enough so i would say that uh, posterior lateral push and engage the metaphyseal bone for the screw not the cartilage so yeah, just my my recommendation if you're not doing too many uh, lateral conda like if you're doing two in a year and if they are displaced or completely displaced my recommendation would be to just do an orif because there are more chances of not getting an adequate reduction or not you know putting proper k wires or the screw whatever you want instead if you open it so say for example you already decided doing you're doing surgery if you open it you can see the articular surface well you can see where you're putting your screw in or your k wires in and you don't have to have that risk of oh you know post op the extra looks really bad because i didn't pin it adequately or i had pinned it but it it still shifted because of loss of reduction so you know if you know if it's more than 4 mm displaced you know those who are doing more and feel comfortable they can push on it and you know get an anthrogram and pin it and avoid open surgery but i don't think there is going to be a whole lot of downside doing it closed versus open in the sense that if you're not really sure opening might give you a better you know visualization of the articular surface because that's what you're concerned about and may avoid you know maltreating it so uh, if in doubt like at in during surgery if in doubt just open it it's it's much easier you know i initially i thought i can scope them and i ended up you know scoping like four or five lateral condyle fractures uh, to aid in my reduction you know because it's just minimal portal i kind of ended up you know doing it for like an hour and a half trying to get my scope position mm -hmm. fracture hematoma and uh, and trying to joystick my fragment in and and there are case series on using scope to assist you in reduction but then i found mm -hmm. that if i open it it takes much less time you know it, the incision is there but i can be done in like 30 40 minutes very comfortably you know putting a couple of pins across and have stopped you know in spite of you know being sports uh, you know i do arthroscopy all the time in spite of that i don't use a scope here just because it's you know one i'm kind of struggling a bit with the scope in a small joint like an elbow and trying to visualize everything and second is that it's much easier to open and see it i'm kind of you know i'm very comfortable so if in doubt just open it yeah so uh, taral just one more point here the pins should engage ossified bone sometimes the feel of uh, passing the pin through cartilage doesn't give you satisfaction because it's soft and most of it is cartilaginous whenever you open also you will see that the fragment is larger than what is seen on x ray so try to engage metaphyseal bone and divergent so that there is some stability and don't uh, keep on thinking that the feel that you get as if in adult or uh, other areas is going to be the same with lateral condyle it does feel a little soft compared to a normal uh, pinning why i am saying this that you keep on thinking that oh this is not stable and you remove the pin and keep on redoing it and actually that buggers up the lateral condyle yeah i agree to that so you know the first step as primal has shown here is to drive the pin inside <laughs> the cartilage you drill it through the metaphysis and this is how he did this primary stabilization and then arthrogram in this patient to confirm the articular congruity there are two ways you can do an arthrogram you can put a die uh, you know just above the radial head as is shown here but uh, you know sometimes uh, i prefer it doing from above the olecranon on take from posterior side because in it, it has much less spillage of the die and offers much better view so there are two ways you can do it 
so these are divergent pins as uh, shown one pin and the second pin and then the third wire so three wires put here out of which the two, two are divergent wires and the upper two are going through the metaphysical area so this is stabilized in plaster and then premolar shown long term follow up this is six weeks you are seeing callus formation fracture line is being held there is no further displacement and uh, this wire should be removed once uh, you are sure about union and premolars is that always check um, on internal oblique view for union because on apr lateral you may feel that fracture line is you know fracture line still visible and get follow regular uh, intervals to make sure that the fracture has very well healed and lastly he gives us a tip that try at your own risk and probably you know this confirms the you know shikal's argument and 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 this has been a for the many orthopedic surgeons and you know many of them like dr chandak dr mukhi etc they always do open reductions of uh, displaced or tilted checking on cm if the reduction was proper if the things are proper see the articular surface uh, you know reduce the fracture so if you are not sure uh, the answer is that you know there is no harm in opening a lateral condylar fracture you know do a close reduction and pinning if if you are very sure with your cm with an arthrogram and with your so i'll show you uh, a technique of uh, uh, close reduction and screw fixation okay so a similar technique here a child with a lateral condyle fracture and what was really you know uh, sort of uh, strange about this fracture was that uh, when the resident sent me the internal rotation view this is how it looked you know so this tells you that uh, this fracture was not stable you know so you know how, what would you say you know so shital and sandeep when you see an x ray like this on lateral view it's almost displacing or translating 50% so this is the you know milch type 2 or un unstable lateral condylar fracture what's happening here what would be yeah yeah i mean it's it's um, it's it's unstable as you said you know your displacement is significantly more i wouldn't have thought based on your first two x rays that the internal oblique would look like this because um the lateral view the second x ray doesn't show any significant displacement but the third one does so i don't know if something happened in between but um, if you see something few things you know one is that you can have a elbow dislocation with the further uh, medial the fracture line goes that means that if you have a milch one the elbow is almost always stable milch one is the one that goes you know the fracture line goes to the capitulum like this so it's a very small fracture there are different complications milch one is like going through the ossification center so you may end up with a growth arrest so that's different but the elbow is almost always stable with a milch one when you have milch to the further medial this fracture line goes the more unstable the fracture is because you have less joint which is intact you can also get a salt or two fracture where the fracture line goes all the way out from here like up here those you can determine that based on the swelling or ecchymosis on the medial side and they behave like a supracondylar fracture so that's a different entity but you know i i i don't think that i've seen ap and lateral look like this and then having an internal oblique or a, probably this is not even internal oblique this is a lateral view if you look at the look at the distal humerus it looks perfectly lateral so it's kind of a little bit uh, uh anteriorly translated maybe touch flexed uh, and um and an unstable elbow so you know for me this would be surgery you know i can attempt to close reduce it once and check it but i'll have a low threshold of doing an orif if needed so whenever i do close reduction pinning i will always have punique on because you know in case you if you're not if your close reduction and pinning doesn't work you should be ready for doing an open on this 
and uh, this is these are few steps again so in of uh, flow reduction and thinning uh, you take view in internal rotation mass stress and my so three points here which are again i'm re emphasizing uh, internal rotation view thumb pressing the fragment and valgus stress and the same thing being seen uh, on the cm and initially you will drive the wire you push the wire through the cartilage you don't drill through the cartilage but moment you reach a cancellous bone then you will start using the drill and this is how the pinning would be done um, again uh, you know this is what should be the direction of wire because it's a posterior lateral fragment you hold it in internal rotation and your pins would go from posterior to anterior and uh, once your pin is put then you do an arthrogram here and in this patient and doing arthrogram from a lateral approach you put a you know, moment you put some a needle the hematoma you know and then you know that you are in joint and uh, you put in the needle put in the dye and uh, The elbow shows, and here you are seeing the fracture line is very fracture, and uh, the articular surface. Always repeat your stress views after doing an arthrogram to see if the fracture line opens up. And once your initial wires are through, you can see here that you see a fracture. You need to give a lot of stress. You see a gap in the fracture. So this is a patient where if you put just wires, it's not going to hold. You need screw and. Uh, Uh, you know compression screw uh, with a wire inside because if you pass only a compression screw over aggressing and tightening the fracture line may open up on the articular surface so you know in, in these patients i always use a wire and a screw especially when the fracture is unstable and uh, this is a follow up at 2 weeks at 4 weeks when i see early healing the wire which is outside comes off and screw which is inside remains and uh, you start mobilizing these patients at uh, six weeks once you start seeing you know better healing feel that the screw is outside here but it is not outside there is if it's if, if it's holding the cartilage and uh, you know this this sort of x ray should be carefully evaluated and this is follow up at four months and the screw came out at nine months and one important point i want to discuss with delegates is many times you would see that uh, there is a lateral kind of overgrowth or a bump which is seen after k wire or screw fixation and parents do get worried about it because sometimes it is visible in a in a thin girl so you know most of these lateral overgrowth would would remodel by 2 to 3 years and uh, become all right is is it a worry when you see this lateral overgrowth uh, shetal any time is it a cause for concern uh, well you need to tell the family before we do the surgery that you know there is 60 to 70% rate of having a lateral spur so there are two things there is a spur that is the localized uh, overgrowth that you see and then there is also a generalized overgrowth from the lateral side which can give you varus so what you need to tell the family is that one is that you can get a palpable or a visible bump you know so sometimes you can see it and i can show you some uh, clinical photographs and sometimes you can feel it but if there is an overall overgrowth on the lateral side which can happen with this fractures then it creates a pseudo varus it's not like you have created a deformity by your by your pinning but because of uh, differential growth the med the lateral side would grow a little bit more and it's called a pseudo pseudo varus because it's not a true varus from the articular surface but it's just because of the overgrowth it doesn't cause uh, you know a a deformity that's severe enough that you need correction but you just need to let the family know up front because it's this you know there have been studies that have done that have been done to see if it's based on the amount of displacement or if it's based on screw versus pins and um, you know one study has shown that the more displacement you have the more spur you're going to form so it could be related to the periosteal stripping but other studies have not you know confirmed it and you know with screw you're getting a really good anatomic fixation in spite of that you are going to end up with a with a spur in most so you can't prevent the spur formation that's just uh, the uh, metaphyseal side uh, overgrowth um, and you need to inform the family about it prior to uh, you know doing the surgery 
Okay, so any any questions from the audience about you know uh, close reduction pinning, close reduction screw fixation? Um, as we you know this uh, that all that that case that you showed was pretty good because if you just look at the wires and before the screws were placed probably if you had just left the wire because the arthrogram was still open. arthrogram didn't show that did you uh, how did you decide to put a screw instead of the uh, k wires because your arthrogram showed that the articular surface was okay then why did you change it mm -hmm. i'm glad you changed it it's just so after after doing arthrogram, I was just checking checking the stress view and on the varus view, it just opened up. On yeah, the and even even without the varus view, you you still saw the gap at the fracture site. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're right that you know just pinning and making sure the arthrogram is okay is not sufficient. You want to make sure it's a stable configuration because even after pinning it, you know you can have loss of reduction if the pinning is not done right. Right. I, I think the pillar needs to be stabilized. The lateral pillar column has to be good and compressed, what official. The yes. articular yeah. part usually but, you know, the, but his even if in, you look at his if you look at his x-rays, he had a pin in the lateral pillar. That's where he put yeah. the screw in. So yeah. um, you know, I'm just I'm just happy that you did it, but you know, I'm just uh, I just think that uh, someone else could just leave it where you were with the K wires, and then it would go for a delayed union because there was a gap, significant gap on the metaphyseal side. Not that you're concerned because your articular surface is okay, but it might go for uh, either delayed union or even a non-union because if, say, for example, there is a little bit early pin track infraction or something and you have to pull the pins out, then that fracture would not have healed because there was such a big gap, you know, on that on the side. So it's it's good that you use the screw but you know, when we were not using the screw, these were the cases that you know, when you take out the wires and the fracture would not have healed and it would still go for a mild union in spite of you fixing it. Or non-union, you know. You, or you, non-union, you yeah. Pins are outside and you remove pins at six weeks and you know, uh, there yeah. are cases where you still get non-union in spite of pinning. So, right, so, so pinning, it doesn't mean, you know, that's what I'm saying is get, pinning is not like, you pin it and then you're done because pinning has to, you have to make sure once the reduction is okay and secondly your stability is restored because even if the reduction is okay if it moves afterwards or if you have to remove the pins early then it it would still go for uh, for a delayed union or 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 a mild union it can move so you want to make sure that you are pinning it right do an arthrogram and then you shouldn't be seeing too much of a gap on the metaphysical side either it's not like you have to have anatomic uh, fixation on the metaphysical side, but the gap that we saw on the x-rays, that was like three or four millimeter gap. Those are big gaps. So you need to, you know, repin it or put a screw across. Sir, I have a doubt, sir. This is Dr. Santosh. Please ask him. Yeah. yeah. Sir, uh, like I mentioned in the group as well, I don't do too frequently. So uh, all this uh, borderline uh, displaced, I, I open, open reduced. So at that time, I don't have a problem in placing the screw. Suppose you are putting a percutaneous screw. So even I, I am afraid that I might damage the cartilage and end up too inside. So how would I know where to stop correctly? Is it just out of experience or the, are there any practical tips? So one practical tip when you're putting a screw is that don't look at the metaphysis because if you are too close to the metaphysis, then probably you would not have a good hold of the screw. You have to look, you have, when you're uh, putting a screw, imagine the entire lateral condyle fragment and try to go in the center. You're still gonna be in the lateral column, but your screw head is gonna be much away from the metaphysis as if it's hanging in air, okay? That's, and if you go back and look at the thoroughs, the screw head is not gonna sit against metaphysis. That means either you're too proximal or your screw is buried in the cartilage. So it should, it needs to have a gap, you know, uh, between the the screw head and the lateral condyle fragment. So that's the tip. So if you see this extra here, if your screw head is against the bone, that means you are in the cartilage, or if you're right here, because that's where the metaphyseal fragment was, you are too proximal and you won't have good purchase. And I'll show you a case of that. You know, I have some complications that I can share with you, I can show you a case, what I mean. So the screw head needs to be, you know, away from the bone. That's your ideal configuration. It, it should seem as if it's in air on this, uh, on, the, um, on the AP view. That's, uh, 
and and you can even put it further you know medial than where it was where Tarul put it you can even go further medial which would be even further away from the from the uh, from the bony part of the of the distal humerus so that's the that's the tip that I would recommend you know and these are cannulated screws so you know make sure your K wire is in the right position and then you can put a screw on it thank you sir. Any other questions? Uh, Sheetal, be ready to share your cases. You know, after this, we'll take your cases, and after that, we'll talk about open reduction. So, you Prima, want me to share it? You in between, yeah, you can you can share. Yeah. Are you able to, Sheetal? Yeah, I'll, I'll share. I think Primal, yeah, in area with low network again is not seen. We'll ask him to put his comments on the WhatsApp group. Can you see my screen? No, we can see. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the natural history of the bump we talked about. You can see that, you know, you have a big bump at nine months and then it remodels over six years. You can see that. So, but the bump is inevitable. You know, there is nothing you can do about the bump you can see here. And, um, uh, let me just, uh, you know, move to some other um, cases that I can share with you. Are you able to see my I'm, I'm, my screen went away just for a minute? Let me just uh, get back. Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Uh, yes. No, no, sir. Some auto bullets is coming. No, sir. You're not able to see my slides? No, sir. Not the slides. Hmm. Can you see the my screen here? Can you see the slides now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so we see natural history of them. Yeah, you can see my slides, right? So the screw yes. thing I was talking about is is this uh, is this case here? You see, this is a seven and a half year old girl with a displaced fracture, and this is a screw that was placed. And you can see the arthrogram shows that it's a really good contour here, right? But the screw, if you see, it's very close to the articular, I mean, the metaphyseal side. And so this is the follow up. You see, yeah, post up actually. It's cut through. Yeah, it's cut through. Well, you know, it wasn't even. Uh, through the fracture, it, it just didn't capture enough because you yeah, see it's posterior. Yeah, very thin bone there. And when and because you're trying, because this is all you can see on the on the if you go back, you know, this is what you're able to see on the excess. So you're trying to get in the middle of this fragment, but that's not where you want. See, the fragment is this big, right? The fragment is this big here. Yeah. So you want to be up up from here. You have to put the screw in, not up here. So you can see that there was a loss of uh, reduction here, loss of fixation in spite of the screw. And then you can see that here is the shoulder, here's the arm, that the the, the screw was- Shita, can posterior. you make it full screen, full screen? Yeah. Can you see it okay now? No. Can no, you it's see the it? Same. It's the same. Don't see the full screen? No. Okay, hold on one minute. Uh, I don't know why I can't show the full screen. Yeah, she will go to slideshow and see uh, on the top, you know, next to file and home. Animation ke baju mein. Resume slideshow, yeah. Yeah, go down and press the resume slideshow. Now when you press, there is a comment comes. 
Yeah, it's but it's not coming right now. Anyway, yeah, Chodo, try. Okay, you can go ahead. <laughs> Another thing you can do is you know increase the uh, percentage. You know, if you go to right bottom, it's showing seventy percent. You can scroll and make it yes. bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, so you, can see see what you can see what has happened is that this is the lateral condyle fragment. Okay, this is the fragment. This is the distal humerus here, and you see where the screw is. To posterior, you should yeah. have the screw right from here where this arrow is. So to proximal, to posterior, and you can see that once we revised it, you see where the screw is going from. This is the fracture site. You can see it well now. Yeah. And the screw needs to go from you know. So if you look at the X-ray, how the screw should look, it should look like you know. Let me just narrow this down a bit. Yeah. You see, the screw should be way away from the metaphyseal side. So if you compare, uh, if you just want to have a look at it, this is this was done open, so it's there is you can't miss it when you're doing open surgery. But uh, you keep this X-ray in mind when you're doing percutaneous uh, screw fixation, where the screw head needs to be. And then it went on to heal, okay, of course. So it's uh, lovely. Super so, demonstration. So so that's one thing. The second thing I showed you about the bump. Um, uh, okay, so delayed healing. So you see this x-ray, four-year-old girl. Uh, these are the injury x-rays. Okay, so it's this is like really undisplaced. You hardly can see it. Um, this is uh, an x-ray taken um, at five weeks. So now, you know, the question is whether you continue with conservative treatment or not, because at five weeks it hasn't healed. It was treated conservative. So but, she fell um, off on lateral view also, you can see that it's it's slipping off. This. And this is at eight weeks. Yeah. So it is two months yeah. now. And you see now you're seeing frank signs that this might not go on to heal okay, because you, know, you see the gap is much wider. Yeah. But we know we informed the family, family very reliable. I still went on to treat it conservative and it healed at 12 weeks. So this is a case of delayed union, treated conservative, but the only thing is that follow-up is absolutely necessary. You know, every time you tell the family, we could do surgery or we could put them in a cast. If you, if you think that we, you're gonna be coming back, you know, in two weeks or three weeks, we can treat it in the cast. So you can see that it went on to heal, but it did go on to delayed healing. So it started from here, where the actual looks like it's really undisplaced. And then five weeks, you can see that, oh, it's, it's not looking that good. and it, eight weeks, a lot of surgeons would jump on to surgery at this time. And it still went on to heal. You know, you, you can see some callus formation that, so that's why you can kind of, uh, you know, wait a little bit, but, uh, but lateral condyles can be slow to heal. Then this is at a 10 month, uh, 10 month follow up. I won't show this case because it's unusual to have a growth arrest, but I'll show you another case of, um, of a mild union. Uh, lateral spur formation again. You know, no matter how you treat it, the spur is going to form, as you see here. The spur is going to be there, posterior lateral, and um, and you can see the spur. You see the demonstrate how it looks here, and so you can get a pretty big spur like this. And you have to tell the family up front that you can see it or you'll be able to feel it. So. Um, so that's that's nothing here. It was uh, the fixation was pretty good, and it was uh, it was done with a screw. In spite of that, have uh, fixing it. This is flexed, and this is laterally displaced. This capitulum fragment, and I don't know at what what point. This is at two and a half months. You see that in spite of uh, um, what I thought was a good reduction, it's not. We got an MRI at six months. The patient has no pain, but he has a 15 degree extension loss. You can see that this this uh, this fragment is not aligned, right? This this part should have been a little bit lower. It's not healed in this area, but rest of it has healed. So it is um, it is not a non-union, but it is a malunited um, lateral condyle. And this is a two and a half year. The patient still had no symptoms, um, a 15 degree extension loss, but no progressive deformity. But you can see how flex this uh, the capitular fragment is. And um, this is a CT scan at, um, at two years. And what it shows is uh, uh, 
what you are seeing here, it's not a non-union, it's the physis actually. The fracture was above it, so the fracture is here, the physis is still open. And um, this is five years post-op, um, no deformity, again, 15 degrees loss of uh, extension. And besides malunion, malunion, you see that there is a little bit of, uh, of an AVN. Now, lately it has shown that AVN is fairly common, more common than what we thought, you know, um, they are saying if you can, it can go up to 20 or 30 percent AVN rates uh, in this area, just at the medial aspect of the uh, of the trochlea. So uh, there is there are different uh, types of you know AVN versus some of them. They say it's a growth arrest, and um, uh, it's usually not symptomatic. So if you see like um, a fishtail deformity, it's not. Uh, if you, if it's a little bit, it's not going to be an issue. Sometimes you can get, uh, you know, um, uh, some uh, either loss of motion, pain, or loose bodies, uh, cartilaginous bodies, maybe in the joint from from a fishtail. But I just wanted to show a case where it was pinned and it still went for a mild union. This patient is lucky not to have any symptoms. I have you know six years follow up on this patient. But at, at some point, if the patient is not happy that this would need an osteotomy and realignment, which is a difficult surgery to do, but has been, has been deported. So something to keep in mind that uh, pain fixation, screw fixation is not the end of the story. The follow-up is what you need. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thanks, Sheetal. And, uh, you know, osteotomy for a mal-united lateral condyle fracture, the, the issue is not that it's it's uh, unpredictable surgery. Even the result of osteotomy can be unpredictable in a way that you're never sure that you're going to get the range of movement back. So uh, I've done a couple of those, you know, osteotomies for mild united lateral condyle fractures, but it's a very tricky surgery, and uh, you're always scared that you will lose motion or you you may not gain motion at the end of that surgery. So it's uh, 7.50, we still have 10 more minutes. Uh, uh, we need to discuss uh, open reduction. I think we can keep it for some other time, uh, you know, because it, it's going to require some discussion. Uh, any question from the audience on what we have discussed so far? You know, we've discussed sort of seemingly undisplaced lateral condyle fractures and then close reduction, pinning, screw fixation, and some of the common complications uh, or sort of, a, uh, you know, some uncommon complications of, uh, Pinning and screw placements. Sir, good evening. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. Sir, I just had a, had a question. Uh, anything that uh, you need to be careful about uh, will you perform an arthrography? I mean, uh, have any of you in, uh, experienced any incidences of uh, anaphylaxis or anything like that? Yeah, so not really. You know, we, we I don't think any one of us even does us, you know, we don't do any test for the dye. Most of the dyes which are used nowadays, uh, unlike the dyes which were used in previous days, you know, uh, really don't have such a high rate of uh, you know, allergy reactions or anaphylaxis. So I have never encountered. We frequently now use dyes you know, for pediatric hip problems and for elbow injuries. So I have not come across. Sheetal, what about you or Sandeep or Premal? Um, no, we do ask for the history of any, uh, you know, um, reaction or anything in the past, but uh, I don't think most of the patients would have had a dye, you know, before our surgery. So it's difficult to have a true history. Um, so not a specific problem about that, but you know, when you have a lateral condyle fracture, my preference is to do an arthrogram from the posterior approach, because if you do a lateral approach, it might just, you may not, might not be able to see your fracture lines very well after that, because you have a pool of dye in that area, especially if it's some extravasation is there. So my, I would go with the posterior approach with the arthrogram, and it's it's very easy. You can just you know put your needle on the posterior aspect right in the midline, go through the triceps into the olecranon fossa. You can see it on the floor, or touch the bone. Sometimes you can have a patent uh, foramen, so just make sure you don't go all the way out um, in the anterior aspect. Uh, once you hit the bone, just pull back and inject just one ml of dye is sufficient. And we use um, you know diluted uh, mixture, so one to one dilution. So half is dye and half is, you know. What, what dye do you use, Shipal, if I may ask? Uh, we use Optiray. Optiray uh, is a, a water-soluble dye. So um, I don't know if there are other dyes that you uh, you use 
Okay. We get something called OmniPack, which is IOHexol. We use one cc plus one cc saline. And yeah. again, last fifth, yeah, last ten years we have been using more than that, and I have had no case of anaphylaxis. And the second, the second thing is when you are doing arthrogram, they are always going to be under anesthesia. I don't think anybody is doing them without anesthesia on OPD basis. So they are already under anesthesia. Whatever, in case something happens, at the most we ask the anesthetist: Is there some fluctuation in BP, or did something happen when I injected? This it's it's not really risky and it's water soluble and gets washed off pretty quickly. Sir, I have a doubt on open reduction. Uh, suppose if we get, uh, we are planning to do a, in case of neglected cases like uh, two three weeks after, is it any different from an acute case regarding dissection or handling it, or is it the same? So at at two to three weeks, it's not going to be different. But I feel if you are operating case at six weeks or three months, it is definitely going to be different. Especially the lateral condyle fractures, which are completely toppled over, the flip tones, because you know it will be very difficult at six weeks or three months to identify which is the fracture sign and which is the articular surface, and you really require very fine dissection, because you know if you make that fragment of vascular in in, in the process of uh, reducing it back, you know you will have. You know, you'll have stiffness. You'll have non-union. You may have a vascular necrosis. So, so at two to three weeks, I don't think it's much difference than a fresh fracture. Thank you, sir. Any any other views on this? Uh, what approach do you use? You know, I've always used the lateral approach, but there are a couple of cases where I've used the POSI approach after reading literature, and, and I found it very easy to do from a lateral from POSI approach to. So these videos I will share. You know, maybe we'll have a next session, part two of lateral condyle, where we'll talk about more detail about open reduction and about delayed presentations. Any any other questions from the audience? All right. I think uh, uh, almost 7:55. We've spoken one and a half hours about the fresh lateral condyle fractures. You know, just the undisplaced fractures and displaced where we are doing close reduction and pinning, and a uh, lot of points being covered here. A lot of tips being given, and uh, even I have learned a lot. You know, from what Sheetal and uh, Sandeep have spoken about, and what questions the audience have put, and the answers to that. So you know, that's one of. Uh, sessions like this, you know, we everyone learns in the bargain. You know, it's not just the delegates learn, but uh, even faculty learns. And uh, thank you everyone for the cases you all are posting. Uh, Sheetal, did you see the olecranon fracture, which was uh, upper and ulna fracture, which was posted on the group WhatsApp group? You know, I just want to know how would you fix that? No, I haven't see, uh, seen it. Was it just posted today? Yeah, it was posted. So if you can quickly have a look and you know give answer to that very interesting fracture. A pediatric fracture, but it's an oblique uh, olecranon in, intra-articular fracture and you know long oblique fracture. Yeah, I see it. Um, here, seven a seven-year-old fresh trauma. Yeah. I think the articular surface, you know, to me looks like it's uh, you know a few millimeters, like two millimeters, could be accepted a gap at the articular surface. It just seems like this is unstable, and it might. Um, it might slip off more, you know. So um, I don't see a, a um, uh, I, I think that I would I would be a little bit more aggressive treating it. That means um, do uh, do surgery, you know. If, um, now, how to fix it? You know, for for adults, oblique fractures, you put plates across because tension bend would, you know, is not the best construct. Uh, tension bend is really good for transverse fractures, but for comminuted and oblique fractures, a plate works better. But for a seven-year-old, I'm not really sure how much you need. So if you just put K-wires, not even do tension bend, but you open and put K-wires and then put a cast on, this should heal in four weeks. That would be, be my approach. I won't plate it and I won't do tension bend, just reduce it and put some K-wires across. No, so I, I thought, since this is not a transverse fracture, not a typical avulsion injury, you know, this is a sort of a shear force plus avulsion. I thought to neutralize fracture like this 
a plate and interfragmentary screw would be more safer and you can mobilize the patient early. Even if the child yeah, no, I, I don't think it's a wrong thing. I think that's that's how we would do it in a little bit older patient, like say if, if it's 12, uh, 12 to 14 or 12 and above, I think I would treat it as an adult, which is you know what you did. But for a seven year old, I just think that it would heal fast, I think. You have a lot of surface area for it to heal. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a there are a few patterns like this where you have you know this is in the sagittal plane, but sometimes you have a coronal plane uh, split of the olecranon, uh, mm -hmm. and I've treated those with just K wires and they've healed okay. Right. So uh, so I think it might do well. I mean, it's uh, if you do uh, interfrag screw and uh, plate, uh, obviously it's going to be more than sufficient. This, this is going to do fine, but you have to take it off, I guess, right? Right. Are, are you removing the? Are you planning to remove it? No, no, I have not treated. You know, that was just my opinion. Oh, so I, a, I think if I think problem. that you know you can, I think you can try to just uh, you know put K wires, reduce it, and just uh, immobilize in a little bit of extension, maybe forty-five degrees or something like that, and it should heal in you know four weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, I think we'll end this session. Thanks everyone for joining, and uh, you know, recording of all the sessions will be available to all the dedicates. So if you need to go through any of the session. Or if you have missed part or the whole of the session, you can go through it. And uh, we'll soon announce the topics for the next week. Uh, and if anything we have not covered, you know, if you have, there are any more difficulties, please write to us and we are very happy to cover this through the week. So with this, uh, Ashok, can we end this session? Sheetal, thanks for joining once again. No, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. I'll be ending the meeting now. Thanks.